I want to minister on this subject of being full and led. Being full and led. Being full and led. And uh, we've been talking and ministering a lot about faithfulness, and we'll continue to minister along those lines tonight. Uh, but the thing that the Lord's been dealing with my wife and I concerning is uh, the importance of being led by the Spirit and the importance of being faithful to what God's asked you to do. You know, I, I've often talked about how the Lord impressed upon me early in my ministry how important it was to be led by the Spirit. And uh, we'll get into some things as we go through here. Ephesians 5, we want to start in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, verse 17. Notice it says, Wherefore be all of you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Verse 16, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Wherefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The Weiss translation says, be constantly taking heed, therefore, how accurately you're conducting yourselves, not as unwise ones, but as wise ones, buying up for yourselves the opportune time. Why? Because the days are pernicious, is the word that it uses. It means the days are destructive, evil. Now, look at the key words here. Accurately and redeeming the time. Take heed how accurately you're conducting yourselves. The King James says how you walk. And the word walk throughout the, the, the King James Bible, the New Testament, it means to conduct your life. Paul says don't walk as other Gentiles walk. All right? He says you want to live accurately and you want to redeem the time. All right? Now verse 18, notice what it says. And do not be drunk with wine... Wherein is excess. But the Greek says, but be being filled with the Spirit. The Weiss translation says, be constantly, here's the word, controlled by the Spirit. Be constantly controlled by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Now, we talked about there for a moment living accurately. Now, we have a pretty good indication of what accurate is. Being accurate. All right? Accurate in, in uh, uh, shooting a firearm. You know, I want to be accurate with that. Uh, I want to be accurate in what I say. Accurate in, in, in the way that I deal with people. But Paul says here, to live my life accurately to conduct myself accurately, and then he says, to redeem the time. Living accurately and redeeming the time will require a whole new level of leading. A whole new level of being led. To live accurately and redeem the time. It will require a whole new level of us being led by the Spirit. Uh, you understand? Be because I want to be accurate and redeem my time. Now, this is not to focus on where you may have missed it or focus on what you haven't done. The focus is to be on redeeming the time regardless of where I may have missed it. Amen. And maybe you haven't missed it. Praise God. You still want to redeem the time because the days spiritually are getting shorter and shorter. The time is getting shorter and shorter before the rapture of the church. And, and once the church is gone, once we're gone, 
then whatever I was supposed to do is either finished and complete or left undone. Amen. Do you understand? Now we're, we're going, but I want to go having nothing left on my planner. But I've got to redeem the time. I'm consistently, constantly asking the Lord, Lord, show me how to make my time more valuable to you. Show me how to make our ministry more valuable to you. How can I make what we're doing more valuable to you? Amen. You know what the answer to that is? Be led. You do know the answer to a thousand and one questions? Be led. Be led. Well, how do I do this? Be led. How do I do that? Be led. How do I know what to do here? Be led. Amen. The direction we're moving has to always be exact. Has to be spot on. As a ministry. See, I'm not the only one in the ministry that's supposed to be led. Right? They, because if you've got a group of people in a church that are being led by the Spirit and hearing from the Spirit of God about what they're supposed to be doing and where they're supposed to be and what their, their part is, then it makes it a lot easier to move that body in the direction it needs to go. Amen. Do, do you understand that? And so it's not just about your life and the things that you're doing. It's about your part of what God wants you to do in the ministry. Whether it's getting involved in a department. Whether it's giving a certain amount or doing something or praying a certain direction. If I'm led and I'm being led exact and spot on, it's moving me in the right direction. Amen. Do you see that? And notice he said we're to constantly... Be controlled by the Spirit. Constantly. How often is constantly? Always. Constantly. I'm constantly being led. Listen, when you're flying in an airplane, especially, uh, uh, well, any, any air, air, aircraft with up-to-date uh, avionics, and you, 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 you take off from the airport, well, you're, you're hitting a headwind or a crosswind, well, you set in the destination in the GPS and in the autopilot. And that system is making corrections more faster than every second. Because it, that, you got that headwind and a crosswind and it's trying to blow you off course. And the system, watch, the system... Is constantly, what's the word? Adjusting. Constantly adjusting. Right? Why are you to constantly be led by the Spirit? Because you have to constantly be making adjustments. Why? Because there's something trying to push you off course. Do, do, do you see this? You know, being led has taken on kind of a bad connotation in some places because, you know, religious people are always feeling led. Sometimes I want to carry a piece of lead around in my pocket. And when people say, well, I feel led, reach in there and grab it and say, so do I. <laughs> I feel led. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like they used to have a, a, you know, that little piece of round wood and it had to it on it. And people say, well, when I get around to it, and you reach in your pocket and say, here you go, you got one. Amen. You got around to it. <laughs> Constantly being led. So that aircraft, why, why is it doing that? Because if you put in a certain heading and you never check your course and you never make any corrections... Well, you, you'll wind up hundreds of miles off your destination. And depending on where you're flying and where you're going, 
if you're flying internationally, you can't afford to be off the course. Because you might be landing in a, in a little island out in the middle of the ocean to refuel and there's nowhere else to go. Amen. So what does that mean? You don't just get in the plane and throw on the autopilot and go to sleep. That, that system is constantly adjusting. It pushes you off a little bit and it adjusts and comes back. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said one of the main things He was going to do, watch, was be our guide. Amen. Lead us and guide us. And according to Paul, how often? Constantly. 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 So how many decisions do you make without consulting the Holy Ghost? None. None. Yeah, but I do this every day. You better oh, wait, constantly be led by the Spirit. Constantly. Why? I want to redeem the time. I want to live accurately. I want to be where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, Jesus said it this way when he talked about the parable and he talked about the man that left and put his servants in charge. And he said one of them began to beat his servants and do them wrong, right? But he said there was another group, another guy, another group of servants that was working and doing the right thing. And he said, this, these servants will be blessed when their master comes back and finds them doing that. Jesus said, in the same time he was talking about the, the unjust judge, he said, when the Lord returns, here's the question, will he find faith in the earth? If you're being led, he will. Why? It takes faith to be led. Listen, the, the biggest question I get asked is how do I know I'm in the will of God? Well, are you being led? I don't know. Then you better figure out. You got to learn how to be led. You got to learn how to listen inside instead of listening to everything outside and letting the periphery guide you instead of letting the inside Holy Spirit GPS direct you. Well, I'm being led to do this, but it doesn't make sense. Then it makes perfect sense. Because your sense is not found in your head. Your sense is found in your spirit. You're a million times smarter in your spirit than you are in your head. Amen. Yeah, but you know, this direction, it just, it just, it, everything should be right. And this should be the direction I'm going. But what are you being led to do? Am I helping you? You're not led by does it feel right. You're led by what are you led to do. Let me ask you a question. Did the tree look good? Did it have good fruit on it? It did. Yes, it did. It had good fruit on it. Did it have good fruit on it? Because it says it was a, a tree good to look at. The fruit was good to taste. But did God say don't? So what was she led by? How it looked, how it tasted, what it could produce. Right? Was Eve spiritually alive? Yes. Did she have the ability to hear from God in her spirit? More importantly, did she hear God with her two ears, look her in the face and tell her not to do it? And still yet, she did it anyway. She was led by what she felt, what, she, what it tasted like, and the potential benefit that it was going to bring her. Amen. All of it looked good. But look what it brought. 
Why? It wasn't accurate. Now, I know somebody said recently that Eve accidentally ate of that fruit. No, she didn't. She chose to eat of that fruit. It's what the Bible says. Not, I'm not against nobody, but I'm just saying it's, it's what the Bible says. You know, people that just make statements like that and don't qualify them, they're not pastors. You've got to have mercy on them. I mean, because they just go on and, I mean, pastors have to explain it because you're going to be back here tonight. We've got to show it to you from the Word. <laughs> Amen. That's why I like being a pastor. Be led. Do, do you hear me? Yeah, but this looks like it should be right. What are you being led to do? Well, there's just something not right there. You better stop. Now, now listen, this is important. You better not go another step. You better not pursue that one more minute. Why? You're not being led to pursue it. So what does that tell you? You're not being accurate. And you're going to do something that's going to cost you more time. And you're supposed to be redeeming your time. Pastor Michelle and I had a situation recently. This became so clear to me. And uh, every time we would talk about it, the direction we were going, man, it should have been right. I mean, it should have been, you understand? It should have been exactly right. And every time we would talk about it, just right here. You know, I say it this way. There'd just be a scratching. Just something wasn't right. And we'd talk about it and, well, that looked, it should be right. That should be the direction we're going. Because look at this. Da, 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 and A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And one, two, three, four, five, six. Chicka, chicka, boom, boom. Will there be enough room? And here we go. Amen. But every time we'd start going that direction, I'd say, sweetheart, this isn't right. And so we'd back off. And then we'd go through the list again. This is why it should be right. But notice now, well, Pastor, you're going back through the list. Yeah, but notice I haven't made any changes. I haven't taken any steps toward that. Because every time I'd start to take a step, I wasn't led to take the step. And, fi and finally, I got into that situation and I figured out why and, and finally heard why I wasn't comfortable with it. If, if you make decisions based on how it should be, well, this should work. I mean, it's, you know... It's, it's perfect. You know, why would there be something else? I don't know. Why are you not being led to do it? Why, why are you being led to stop? That must mean there's something that you're not seeing. We're constantly controlled by the Spirit. Well, why don't I feel good about this job? And why don't I feel good about this? It should be, it should, it's, it's the perfect job. It's what I need and the benefits. But why don't I feel good? Because you're not being led to do it. And you can't, listen. You cannot, Lord help me, Father help me say this right. You can will yourself to be led. And call it being led. But it's not being led. Amen. Amen. Because often the, the leading of the Holy Spirit goes against what I will to do. I have to submit my will to His leading. You understand me? When, when, I, when I allow all the peripheral noise and distractions to lead me, I'm always, 100% of the time, going to miss where God's trying to take me. Always. We cannot afford, now this is going to sound like a simple statement, to not constantly be led. You can't afford it. And I want to emphasize that word, afford. You cannot afford. It will cost you too much 
to not be led. And I've heard people say, well, the only thing we lost was a little bit of time. The only thing you can't ever get back. So there's no such thing as a little bit of time. Every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month is important. Remember what the Lord said? He said, Philip, there are people that got up today and didn't give me any attention at all. They went about their day and just like I didn't even exist. Now how? He said hundreds of millions. So there are hundreds of millions of people this morning that Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God have nothing to say about the direction of their life. Now what kind of messes are hundreds of millions of people potentially going to get into? But see, you got up this morning and gave him your time first. And listened to the Holy Spirit. And you were led. And you're going to be led all day. And you're going to be led tonight. And you're going to go to bed led. And you're going to get up led. Why? Because we're going to be led by the Spirit and be full of the Spirit. Amen. Look at, look at uh, Luke chapter 4. Our success as a body is directly tied to hearing and being led by the Spirit. Directly tied. And you know, let, let me say something here. Because before you just tag somebody with a moniker or a tag of, you know, oh, they're so led by the Spirit, look at their life. Is there evidence that they're being led? I mean, why do you think that person's so spiritual? What makes you think they're so spiritual? That's the question I'm asking you, for you to ask yourself. Why do I think they're so spiritual? Why do I put so much emphasis on what they say? Is it because somebody else gave them honor? Is it because somebody you respect talked about them? I'm, I'm, I'm saying this under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Look, look, at, look at their leading, look at their track record of being led, and then decide if you, if, if, if you want to put stock in what they're saying. I mean, really look. Don't just look at the periphery. Don't just look at the outside. Really look. I tell people all the time, listen to people. I've, I've endeavored over the years I've been pastoring this church to do what I say will do. Especially if I say the Lord said. Especially. And, and, and we've done it. And we'll continue to do it. Look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. It says concerning Jesus... And Jesus, being what? Full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was what? Led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was full of the Spirit and led by the Spirit. Now was Jesus... The divine, perfect Son of God. Was He the Word made flesh? Was He born of a virgin? God in the flesh. And yet He still had to be full and led. Amen. Do you see this? The word led here means to lead, to guide, to direct. So he was led, he was guided, he was directed. Jesus 
by the Holy Spirit. And where was he guided or directed by the Holy Spirit to? The wilderness. To what? Be tempted of the devil. Amen. Now, was Jesus successful in his confrontation with the enemy? Was he? Yes. Why? He was successful in his confrontation with the enemy because he was where he was led by the Holy Ghost to be. When you're where the Holy Ghost told you to be, you receive Holy Ghost empowerment. That's, that's just the bottom line. He wasn't successful just because he was Jesus. Oh, well, pastor, that was Jesus. Jesus, full and led. Not just Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus was always full and led. Well, you're probably right, but how did he maintain that? There, 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 there's things that the Bible tells us we need to do. Jude said, you build up your most holy faith praying in the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 that you make a conscious effort to remain full and controlled by the Holy Spirit. You choose to do that. Amen. That means you don't just start off to make a decision and then halfway into it go, oh, wait a minute, we better ask. <coughs> You should have asked before you ever made the decision. Now, I'm not talking about being goofy here. I mean, being led by the Spirit. This is not seeing a demon behind every bush and a demon in ties and a, and a demon in, in shirts. And, oh, that tie you have on. It, that's the image of a demon king. Eh, ain't no demon on my tie. I don't have demon ties. We're not being goofy. But Jesus returned from the Jordan, notice, full and led. Where the Holy Spirit leads you to be is where you find His empowerment. Where He leads me to be, what He leads me to be doing. A lot of believers face unnecessary challenges because they're not being led by the Spirit as to what they should do and where they should go. And so they face a lot of unnecessary challenges. Hallelujah. And they, and they allow other things to dictate to them, their finances. People. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, the Lord's been dealing with me to get involved in that but. No, there's no but. The Lord's dealing with you to get involved with it. Your job is to take the step you can take to get involved with it. Why? Because that's what He's leading you to do. Well, I believe the Lord's going to enable me to do this and to pay for this and to do this. Well, what are you doing about it right now? Well, you know, I can't do all of that right now. Who's talking about all of it? You said the Lord was leading you to get involved with it and that He might want you to pay for it. That's what you're thinking. But you haven't yet gave $5 into it. You're denying the leading, expecting abundance. Where's that abundance coming to you at where the Holy Spirit's leading you to be? <laughs> Do you see this? Well, I'd like to get involved with that and I'd like to give this amount of money into that. Okay, but here's the thing. Somebody said, but I don't have that money yet. But now wait a minute. Did he say all at once? Well, the Lord told me to give $5,000 into that project all at once. Well, no, now, Pastor, I didn't think about that. Right, see, you just ran off and thought God meant all at once instead of taking time and saying, now, what, what's going on here? Can I, why don't you ask him questions? Can I give that $100 at a time? 
Are you going to bring it to me and I'll give it all at once? How do you want me to do it? And there are countless people that miss blessings and face unnecessary challenges because they're just not being led and they're not where they're supposed to be. Amen. Do you see this? Churches get into trouble because they're not led by the Spirit. Not led by the Spirit in their endeavors. Not led by the Spirit in their programs. Amen. Listen, I lost the fear of man so long ago, I don't even remember when I lost it. I could give a fly and flip about what anybody thinks about what we do. Why? Because, listen, I'm, I'm doing this for God. You're His sheep. I need to do what he tells me to do with you. Amen. Do do you understand this? When people go to changing things, because, well, we got to change this because we got to stay relevant and we got to do this and we got to do that. And I'm I'm not against relevance or what they call relevance. That's that's not the point. I'm not against it. But then you got people going to extremes to try to be relevant. One dear dear minister the other day saying that she was going to get a tattoo just to make religious people mad. And I thought all the things going on in the world in people's lives that you could be using the word of God to change and you're up there talking about wanting to make people mad and you're going to go get a tattoo to make religious people mad and there are people that are need answers and you're more concerned about seemingly being relevant. Amen. Do you see this? My endeavors have to be led by the Holy Spirit. One of the main responsibilities of any pastor is to be led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. We're not led by numbers. We're not led by opinions. We're not led by trends or money or pressure. We're led by the Spirit. Don't ever let pressure move you. That's what pressure comes to do. Pressure comes to move you away from the leading of the Spirit every time. That pressure presents itself to move you away from being led by the Spirit. And and I've watched this over the years. I I would talk to people and I would say, all right, well, they'd say, this is what I think I need to do. And I'd say, do you have peace there? Do you feel the Holy Spirit's leading? Yes, I do. And man, things would just be good. And I've watched people over the years come to me and say, well, but I've decided to do this. But wait a minute. You said you had peace. I've never seen that turn out well. Why? Pressure. I've had, I've had people call and say, well, yeah, we're going to leave the church. Oh, well, 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 well why? Well, you know, can we talk about it? Well, you know, our kids, they want to go to another church. Oh, so now you're led by your kids. And not the Spirit. Boy, I lost my crowd. Well, you know, they just have this youth group over here. And, and you know, it's really happening. And, and you know, the kids just really want to go to that youth group. Well, what did the Lord say? You said the Lord brought you here. They're not led by my kids. Not led by family. Not led by how far we got to drive. Am I right? More of you in here too. You drive a ways. You know, I laugh sometimes because pastors say, well, you know, so-and-so was coming to our church, but, you know, they, they, you know, they drive a ways. Listen, I got people right here this morning that drive at least an hour one way, am I right? 45 minutes anyway. I got, I got, I got, let me see, one, two, three families in Little Rock Church drive an hour and a half one way to every service. And never miss a service on Sunday. And one of those families drove an hour and a half more to come to every night of faith explosion in Clarksville. Every night. 
But people will say, well, you know, we need to find a church close. What if that's not where the Holy Spirit's leading you? What answers are you missing by going close when God said go somewhere else? If you're led by mileage, that'll always, that'll always be the pressure that'll move you. Amen. You remember I've told you the story about going to Pastor Morton's church and being the only white guy there? And he told me, he said, Philip, for six months we thought you was with the FBI. <laughs> and he meant it. He wasn't joking. He meant it. And I've had people wonder, why are you going over there to that church? And you know, people will roundabout say things that have racist undertones. Why don't you go somewhere? Go ahead and say it. Where the people are like you. Well, what do you mean? Handsome? Spirit-filled? I mean, what do you mean? Now, here's my point. There are people that would not go to that church because it's what they say it's a black church. But I thought the Bible said Christ is all. I thought the Bible said for our terms there's not black or white or Hispanic, right? Christ is all. Now here's my point. So if that's the truth, then I want to be where I'm led to be. Not with my own people. <coughs> Amen? Amen? But people will do that. I had a person tell Pastor Michelle and I that, well, you know, we appreciate everything, but, you know, the kids want to go to this church. Oh, okay. So now the kids are leading us as to where we need to go and what we need to do. Now that may sound a little direct, but then if you, if you pull your family out of a church and you go somewhere else because you want your kids to feel more comfortable, how, what's going to happen when everything starts caving in? What are you going to say? What are you going to do? I had a family that came to the church and left seven times. And every time they left... They were mad, and every time they came back, they'd say, well, you know, we tried to find somewhere else, and the Lord kept leading us back here. God gave them seven chances. <laughs> they never would constantly be led. Am I helping you tonight, today? Pressure comes to move you away from the leading of the Spirit. Whatever that pressure is. Whatever that pressure is. Look at Acts 17. This will be our last scripture. Everyone say, I'm full, I'm full. And, I'm and I'm led. Say it again. I'm full, I'm full. And, I'm and I'm led. Acts chapter 27 and verse 9. This, of course, is when Paul is on the ship here. And it says, when much time was spent and sailing was dangerous because the fast was now already uh, passed, Paul admonished them, saying, Sirs, I perceive. He didn't say, I feel. He said, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Paul was being led by the Spirit. Why? The only way he could have known this was by the Spirit. He had no indicator of this in any other way. I perceive that this is going to be a bad situation. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven, the harbor where they were, was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence, if by any means they might attain to Finis, and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth towards the southwest and northwest. Now notice, verse 13. 
And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosed, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. Now Paul's led by the Spirit. The centurion and the captain are led by the circumstance. Paul was led by the Spirit. They were led by the comfort of the harbor. Because where we're at's not very comfortable. Now, anybody can take any, any truth and run the wrong way with it. But I, I want you to understand this. An easy time is not an indication that you made the right decision. Just because everything's going smooth. I'm not saying that things won't go smooth in the will of God. But just because everything's going smooth is not an indication that you made the right decision. Why? Were you led by the Spirit or the easy time? Led by the Spirit or the lack of obstacles that you saw? Well, this is the path of least resistance. Well, I thought that was a worldly saying. Sometimes the path God takes you down looks like there's plenty of resistance. I was talking to Rusty just the other day. Here's Amy, and all y'all know, of course, they're married. But I was talking to Rusty the other day, and his lawyer called him and said, It's all gone, right, Amy? And they said it would be years, right? But every, everything's done. He don't have to pay nothing more. Don't have to go to any more meetings. Am I right? Told her, off the books. And in the beginning, he was looking at over 20 years in prison. And it didn't look easy. They had to stay on the lawyer. Amy would look at the lawyer. Honest to goodness. When, you know, when you're fighting for your life and you're fighting for something that is precious, you'll go to links to do it. She would look at the lawyer and pound the table and, and call his name and say, look at me. Say this. Everything is going our way. Yeah, but that lawyer didn't know what they were saying. Yeah, but they knew what they were saying. And it looked impossible, and it looked like the odds were stacked against us. It looked like it wasn't going to work out. But yet I sat there and watched the glory of the Lord fill that courtroom. And I watched the judge look at the prosecuting attorney and say, I see a totally different man sitting here today. Amen. Amen. The devil wants you to take a plea deal. He wants you to settle for a little bit. Don't do it. Don't be led by the comfort of a situation. Anybody can do things when it's easy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Also, a difficult situation is not an indication that you should move. Well, if I was in the will of God, would I be going through this? Mm-hmm. Sometimes, yeah. I'm not, now, I'm not talking about sickness and disease and poverty. Even though you have to overcome those. The, that pressure is going to come. But you know what? You're going to make it. You might have 45 bills staring you in the face today that got to be paid by the end of the week. But you're going to make it. You're going to make it. But don't be led. The difficult situation is not an indication that you should move. I want to do what I'm led to do. We move when the Spirit says move. Hey, I'm serious. We stay when the Spirit says stay. Why haven't you done this? Spirit told me to stay here. Listen, that has become such an integral part of my life. I'm not saying I'm 100% or know everything. I'm just saying it has become such a question to me that no matter what we're talking about, it always comes out of my mouth. What are we led to do? 
And, and my wife and I don't make decisions based on how it appears. This, is, this looks like it should be the way we go, but how are we being led to go? How are you being led? Because a lot of people found themselves in situations they never would have encountered had they been led by the Spirit. You can be doing the right thing that you weren't led to do and get in trouble. Because doing the right thing will not overcome your violation of the leading. Well, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to work with this group because you know it's a good thing. Are you supposed to go? Are you being led to go? Well, why wouldn't that be a good thing to go help them? I don't know. Have you checked here? Or you just want to go do something good? I've had offerings before that they would come around and I'd say, you know, Lord, should I give into this? Nope. Okay. Well, what are people going to think if you don't give? Don't care. Wasn't led to give. And then I've given money to people that people are like, how could you give them money? I was led to do it. I'd never give money to that guy unless I was led. I know it's good. I'm a good preacher. Amen. Amen. You, do you understand that? Now, I'm almost done. What time is it? Anybody got a watch? Mine quit. Oh, my goodness. Let me see. I got another page of notes here somewhere. Oh, I do. Look, see, I got another one. But no, we'll, we'll stay with this when I'm almost done. Get y'all to Fu Manchu Buffet. <laughs> or the new pizza place. Yeah, hallelujah. But I'll tell you, I'll just warn you that if we go right now, the Baptists are there. Amen. So you'll have to wait. They're a little slower than we are. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Am I, am I led to do that? I remember hearing Pat Harrison talk about the guy called her that she has, has been her auto dealer for 25 years, 30 years. And said, it's time to renew the lease on your car. You know, come on down, we'll do the paperwork. And she said, I need to pray about it. And I remember writing down my notes. She prayed about something she's done for 25 years. Why? Just because you did it last year doesn't mean you're supposed to do it this year. I need to be led. Why? I can get Keith Butler stood in an airport and was about to get on a plane to go home. And as he, he's standing there in line with his ticket, and he took a step forward, and the Lord said, Don't get on that plane. And he turned around and told the minister that was traveling with him, he said, I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit told me not to get on this plane. I'm not getting on the plane. And the guy said, I want to get home and went and got on the plane and the plane crashed and killed everybody on it. What was that man led by? Getting home. The greatest, one of the greatest things Pastor Caldwell looked at me and never said to me, he said, Philip, you don't ever have to be anywhere. I don't have to be anywhere if I'm not led. I'm not getting on the plane if I'm not led. I don't need a leading to do something. I need a leading to not do it. Or let me re rephrase that. I don't need a leading to not do something. I need a leading to do it. You understand? Hallelujah. There, there are things you just, you don't need a leading to not do it. There are things that just make sense. You just, you just don't do it. You don't need a leading to not do it. Right? Here, listen, you don't need a leading to not stick a fork in that outlet. 
You just, you don't do that. Right? You don't need a leading to not get in an airplane when there's ice coating the wings. You don't need a leading to not get in that airplane. I was about to get in the car and, and, and go such and such, and I just felt like I shouldn't go. Put it in park. Go back inside. Why? You were led not to go. Yeah, but why not? It doesn't matter why not. It, do, it doesn't matter why you were led not to go. You were led not to go. That's enough. That's it. That settles it. That's enough. I was led not to go. Yeah, but they won't understand. They, they don't have to understand. You obeyed the leading. That's why, my family, that you are trying to stay full of the Holy Ghost so you can be led by the Holy Ghost. You're not staying full to speak in tongues. You're staying full to be led. Do you understand that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, my, my, I had a good friend that I had invited to come minister. And we'd had it on the calendar for a number of months. And I got up one morning and the Lord said, Call Pastor Ramos and tell him you're canceling this meeting. I don't like to, I've never canceled anybody except him. I don't like to cancel meetings. It's, it's, it throws people's schedule in, a, in, in, in it's, it's not good business. But I called him up and I said, Pastor Noel, I said, I know you'll understand this because you're a man of the Spirit. I said, I don't know, but we need to cancel this meeting. The Lord, the Lord hasn't told me why, but we need to cancel it. And of course, he was very gracious and we canceled it. I hung up the phone and the Lord's never explained to me why, but here's what he did tell me. He said, you'll never know what you avoided by canceling that meeting. People say, what was it? I don't need to know. I did what I was led to do. I don't need to know why I was led to do it. I just need to know I followed the leading. I know something was avoided. Amen. You know how many house fires could have been avoided if somebody would have paid attention to that feeling? Did I unplug that iron? And then they go, oh, that's just me. I always do. I always unplug the iron. They didn't that time. Oh, pastor, that's something simple. No, no, no. Your house staying in one piece isn't simple. It's vital. You and your family being safe everywhere you go is vital. And Paul said it's even more important because the days are destructive. Am I helping you this morning? Amen. Amen. Even, even doing a good thing that I've not been led to do can get me in trouble. Yeah, but I'm doing the will of God. Not by doing something you're either led not to do or something you weren't led to do. You can't say doing something is the will of God if you weren't led to do it or you're going against a leading. Amen. Amen. Yeah, but I just got to do this and I just got to get home. You don't have to do anything that compromises the leading. I don't have to be anywhere and I don't have to do anything anybody tells me to do if it compromises the leading that I'm feeling. Just don't have to. Well, you'll miss a great opportunity. No, I won't. I'll set myself up for a bigger opportunity. Are you following me? Let me hurry. Building a building is a good thing if I'm led. Pastor Michelle told me she was here last Sunday, and she said she was ministering. She had her eyes closed, and she said all of a sudden it just came up so big in her spirit. We're not this building in big enough anymore. I've had people ask me for 20 years, when are you going to build a bigger building? When it's time. I'm, I'm serious. It's not, listen, it's not because I'm small-minded. It's not because I don't think big. It's not because I can't believe God. 
It's because every time I would approach him about it, he'd say there's no reason to do it. And I'm looking around here this morning, I still see chairs empty. Don't you? And that's not an indictment against anybody. I'm just saying that there's empty chairs. So that means we can fit more people in here. But the Holy Spirit said we're too small. So now what do you do? You build on that. And he can lead me in that vein. That doesn't mean go build a building. It's like the guy that was plowing or getting ready to go plow. And he looked up in the sky and saw GP. So he quit farming and went to preaching. After a few months, he failed miserably and was starving. He said, well, Lord, you told me to go preach. I saw GP. He said, no, that was go plow. <laughs> Should ask the Lord about that. What do GP mean? <laughs> We're not led by how crowded we are. I've, I've seen so many ministers. That they'll, hit, they'll hit a tough time. They'll hit a time when it, it seems like you know, their, their growth has stalled or, or maybe they're not where they want to be. And they'll, they'll come to the determination that they're not in the will of God because they're not breaking the walls out. Is that what the Lord said? I had, to, I had to talk to an elder minister that way one time. And I'm very respectful of my elders, but I had to talk to him. I said, what tells you you're not in the will of God? Well, this can't be the will of God just to have this many people. Did God tell you to come here? What did he say? It was something real intelligent like, I don't know. Yes, God had told them to be there. Did they stay there? Mm -mm, no. I had, I had a friend of mine was having three services on a Sunday in his church. Packed out. I preached in that church. Packed out. Air conditioner wouldn't keep it cool in the summer and, and, and you had to run the air in the winter. I mean, you walked in that church and it was just like body odor. It was just, whoa. Everybody, I mean, a great, great atmosphere to minister in, anointed. But the point is, is he started, he started getting upset and concerned because he's happened to have three services on a Sunday and it's an old building and we're packed out. Yeah, but the anointing was there. People were getting saved. People were getting set free. And he made a decision outside of being led. Went and hawked all the land God had given him and went into debt for a, a building and paid millions of dollars for the building and hundreds of thousands to renovate it. And lost it all. Well, how do you know? Because the Lord told me. I went to the Lord about it. He's a good friend of mine. I went to the Lord about it. I said, Lord, what about this? And he said he started being led by the situation he was in. He ended up having a stroke. Almost killed him. And the Lord told me, he said, he had that stroke because he got out of my will and went and went in debt for that building and it almost killed him. Amen. It's better to stay where you know the Spirit led you even if it looks like you're not as successful as somebody else. Amen. When the Spirit, where the Spirit leads me is where my provision is. That's where my provision is. Is where the, your spiritual provision and your natural provision. When you're where God told you to be, that's where you'll be fed. That's where your provision comes from. When you're where God told you to, a lot of people are not experiencing success on their job because God never told them to be on that job. I'm serious. Yeah, but it's what I like to do. Okay, but is it where God told you to be? See the wheels turning. Yeah, but they're so good to me and they're so this. But is it meeting your needs? Do you have abundance? Is God blessing you on it? See, there's a lot of questions to ask. Not just are they treating me good. 
Well, they like me. Okay, but is the blessing on you there? Because where God tells me to go, the provision will follow me. Amen. So you be where you're told to be, doing what you were told to do. And what will happen? The provision will follow you. Now, I, I'm, I'm real honest with you. I know this is elementary. Yeah, yeah, Pastor, you know, we, we need to be led. And we, it's the most vital thing you can be. Is led. Why? Because there's a lot of decisions coming up. Let, let, me, let me share this with you. You know, we've been pastoring two churches for a number of years. And, you know, people say, well, you know, why do you have to be led so much? Because I recently had an opportunity come up. There's a person who wants to basically give us a church. Well, I should say this church building has been made available for us to use in a city about an hour from Little Rock. They want me to go look at it. I, I need to know what do I need to do. Oh, but it's expansion. But is it where God told me to go? See, but this involves the whole body. It's not just me. It's us. Moving in the same direction. See, it involves you fulfilling your calling. Why did God bring you here? Why did you go through the years of school that you went through? Why has God put an anointing in your life? Now here's the question then. Now what am I going to do? Because there's things for all of us to be doing. And then there's a fourth church that's being made available to me. They want me to pastor all four of them. We got to be led. You see why we need a plane? Now, but here's, here's the question. And this is, this is a bit challenging. It's, it's lovely, lo, in love challenge. What's your part? What's my part in this? Do I get involved financially? Do I, do I get involved... Minister, what's my part? You've got to be led into it. You've you got to be led into it. See, don't... Remember what uh, Mordecai told Esther when he went to her and he was telling her what they were doing? And you remember what he said? He said, if you don't do anything, don't just sit back and think help's going to come from somebody else. <coughs> Because you're in the king's palace. He said, you were brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. See, never come to a church and just think, ah, you know, so-and-so will handle that. What if so-and-so's not here next year? I'm serious. How do you know they're going to be here? Well, they've always been here ever since I've been here. How do you know they're still going to be here? You don't want to be Ralph Mouth. Anybody remember Ralph Mouth? Happy days. Remember Ralph? <coughs> Ralph always played basketball, sit on the bench. One day all the stars and then the second stringers and the third stringers all got hurt. And the coach looked down at the end of the bench and said, Mouth, you're in. He jumped up, pulled off his warm-up suit, had his street clothes underneath it. He said, the coach said, what? He goes, I never play. <laughs> so he just came, put on the warm-up suit, and sat there and watched the game. Because I never play. You know what? If you're a preacher in here, you better be preparing lots of outlines. Because there's going to be things for you to do. Well, when? Quick. Faster than you think. Why? The Holy Spirit's leading us somewhere. The time is over for you to look and say, oh, Pastor will get that. Pastor Michelle will get that. So-and-so will get that. No, how about you'll get that? How about it's my turn to get in the game? 
You understand? Do you see this? Now, I'm telling you all this for a reason. We got to be led. Now, there's no guarantee that any of those two extra things, we're seeking the Lord. I'm just telling you, those are opportunities that are presenting themselves. And years ago, probably 20 years ago, I would have just been chomping at the bit to go do both of them. Not chomping so much now. Not because I don't want to do it, but, but because I've, I've learned something. The more I'm led by the Spirit into what He wants me to do, the easier it is for me and on me. I mean, think about this for a minute. Who's going to teach FBIMA? Who's going to handle Wednesday nights? I know what you're thinking. Oh, you got help. What if they're not here? Who then? Well, but you know, I mean, I can, I can play the keyboard, but you know, Kathleen's always here. What, what, um, hang on. I certainly don't expect her to go anywhere. But I'm just saying, what if God leads her to another area of this ministry? What if God puts her helping over here? Or what if God has her traveling back and forth somewhere? Then what? Well, you know, Kevin's playing them drums. Yeah, but what if, what if the Lord brings Kevin to a part of this ministry where he's sharing the word? At the time, he's normally playing the drums. What then? I need to be being led. Listen, I want to be six to ten moves ahead of the situation. I want to be neck deep in the leading before the circumstance ever shows up. Amen? We got to be led because there's a lot to do. If you have a ministry call on your life, it's not a coincidence God brought you here. It's not a coincidence He brought you here, and it's not going to be His will the whole time you're here just to sit and soak on the bench. We're getting ready to do some things. And what are we going to be? Full and led. Full and led. Full and led. Everybody say out loud. Full, Full and led. And led. Say it again. Full, Full and led. I'm full, Full and led. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I believe God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, as I'm closing with this, <sighs> thank you, Lord, I'll say that. Thank you, Lord. You, you, you can't, when the Lord took me to deeper life, Years ago, 20, 23 years ago. And uh, I sat on that front row. You know, I, Brother Charles, I was anointed. You, you got to understand, I, I'd been ministering since I was 16. I mean, I always knew there was a call of God on my life. It wasn't like I went there and I'd never done anything for God. But here's my point. When I went there and the Lord basically told me, you're going to sit here. The whole time I went there, the whole time I went there, I ministered twice. The whole time. The whole time I was there. And, 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 and here's why. I'm saying this, especially for those of you that have a, a call on your life, ministry call. The Lord had to, had to get something into me. I knew how to preach. 
I, I knew the word forward and backwards. I was raised in church. Not just raised in church, I was raised on the front row of the church. I was raised by preachers. I mean, I was told from the time I could understand, God has a call on your life, you have a purpose for your life. Okay? But here, here was the thing. God had to take me somewhere to teach me how not to just preach, but to minister to people. Pastor Morton looked at me one time with tears in his eyes, and he said, anybody can preach. You've got to be able to minister to the people. And he said, when you get to that point, God can use you. Well, what would you do, Pastor? I just settled down. I said, I'm just here to learn everything I can learn. And I'll be very honest with you. I didn't, I didn't learn any outstanding theology. Edward Morton is not a theologian. He makes up words. I call them Mortonisms. He'll say something when I'm over there, and he'll say something preaching, and I'll look at the guys and say, Mortonism. And, and that's just how it is. But here's the point that I'm making. I didn't learn any deep theology. You know what I learned? How to be led. I learned how to hear the voice of God. That's what I learned. Because I'm learning from a man that doesn't have a sixth grade education. And everything that he has is because of God. That building, that land, that ministry, everything he has is because of God. I had lunch with him the other day, and he's driving a brand new Cadillac with reclining seats in the back. The thing will drive itself going down the road. Amen. And God's done it all. I learned to be led. See, the ministry call was already on your life when you came here. I didn't have nothing to do with that. God brought you here to learn something. For some of you, He brought you here to learn faith. For others of you that may have already known that, He brought you here to fine-tune you so you can step out and do what God wants you to do. And for others, He gave you a base, He gave you a father, He gave you a mother, and He gave you a family. Whatever reason that God has you here, especially as a minister, here's, here's what you do. Get ready and listen to me. I'm the head coach. I'm telling you something. We're about to call your number. It's here. That time you've been waiting on, this is why you've been doing all those layups. That's why you've been shooting free throws for an hour after practice every day. That's why God's had you in the Word and showing you things in the Word and you got notebooks full of messages that you've never preached to anybody but yourself. Amen. Do you see that? That's why you're here. And we're going to do it. We're going to do it big. We're going to do it grand. Amen. Amen. The church I see is a city-taking church. The church I see is a spiritual production center. Produced in life, city, state, nation, and world. That's the church I see. And you're a part of that. Amen. Let's stand up today. As you're standing up, say, I'm full and I'm led. I'm full and I'm led. Hallelujah. I am full and I am led. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now we'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be ministering on faithfulness. More specifically, the faithful will abound with blessings. Hallelujah. I know we had been having 
our afternoon class. We're going to forego that until not next week, week after. But do your best to be back here tonight at 6. The Lord's going to do some wonderful things. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe God. Well, say it out loud with me. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.